Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is John Popoli. He's the director of Freedom on Trial, the new movie from Libertarianism.org. He's the founder, CEO, and executive creative director of Emergent Order, an Austin-based creative agency and film production company. Welcome to Free Thoughts, John. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a, it's a real honor. So I want to get into these new movies from Libertarianism.org, Freedom on Trial, but I mean, let's start by giving our audience a bit of your background. How did you get into filmmaking? So if I step back before really getting into being interested in, in video, um, I've always had a sort of uh, argumentative bent. So I always I, I've been getting into political debates with friends and family for probably longer than I had an interest explicitly in filmmaking and video and editing and the and the craft of the of, of film and video. Um, but when, in a way, when I think about it, my some of my earliest video projects had a political bent. My co-founder Josh Myers and I, who's um, also been my best friend since fifth grade, actually made. A, a, a political satire in high school uh, that for the for the for the, uh, the little internal like closed circuit TV system in our little Catholic high school. <laughs> so you know you could say we sort of got started at this intersection of trying to do you know creative video and also have a kind of uh, um, you know political or philosophical bent. I went to film school at, coming out of coming out of high school and. Coming out of film school, that interest in philosophy and politics really took a back seat, and I, I got a job entry level at MTV, actually in the animation department. The folks that did Beavis and Butthead and and uh, Daria and Celebrity Deathmatch, and then over the course of twelve years, uh, worked up through the MTV networks of you know the the collection of networks that are owned by uh, Viacom. So I worked at MTV. I worked at Nickelodeon, which is also where I met my wife, Lisa, who's uh, the other co-founder of Emergent Order with me and Josh, and then moved to Spike TV. And at Spike, I ended up for, for the last I, I was there for seven years and the last several of them as a creative one of two creative directors. And so as a creative director at Spike, I was responsible. I would direct some spots, some commercial spots and some longer form sort of uh, marketing interstitials and pieces like that. But then I also oversaw the overall communications and marketing for about half of the network's um, content, their launches, uh, the, the, the show launches. I was responsible for the, the campaigns um, for the, a show called uh, uh, Deadliest Warrior and um, A Thousand Ways to Die both <laughs> and a lot of other sort of uh, – stuff from at spike as well as like the big award shows. So that was my, I, I started off in, in film school and ended up professionally working in, at this intersection of, you could say film and commerce in, in the form of um, advertising and marketing. What sort of stuff uh, in, in those years, MTV and Nickelodeon and spike, what sort of sort of stuff, the most interesting things that you worked on at that time, for example, at MTV, did anything that listeners might be familiar with? So I think um, when I was at uh, MTV, we were – I graduated in 99, started working in MTV, began working in the series development department for animation. And when the dot-com boom hit, that entire department was eliminated in one of the largest layoffs in like MTV networks past 20 years. And I actually lost my job and then was – after several months, um, found a new position at Nickelodeon. So I uh, I was a victim of the of uh, of the credit cycle, even though I wasn't yet super engaged in the boom and bust <laughs> the way I would be later, um, from a philosoph philosophical you know causal standpoint. Um, at Nickelodeon, I worked on uh, in, again in the promos department. So perhaps my most famous project was I I was given my first chance to edit a movie trailer. And it was for a uh, an animated TV a TV movie special for a show called Rocket Power, and the movie uh, 
so it's like this it's it's this, the, the the show for you know there might be members of your audience who w- watched it growing up but especially if they're millennials but the uh the show um was this group of kids who were lived in Hawaii and were like sort of skate kids without too much of a hard edge <laughs> to them <laughs> and uh and the movie was essentially terrible because it's just <laughs> But I, I, my, the approach I decided to take was, I, okay, if I'm going to cut a movie trailer, I want to do one of those big, awesome movie trailers with the guy that says, in a world. <laughs> and so I actually – so I, I watched every movie trailer I could, I, could, I could find on the Apple trailer site, which is still a great place to find them. But at the time, it was probably one of the only places to like aggregate movie trailers. And then basically ripped off all of the best tropes I could. And then I wrote this script – uh, tracking against that, treating the movie like the most epic thing you will ever see, and then actually got the vo- the, the famous Don LaFontaine, who who is the guy that made famous the inner world <laughs> where one man must fight, <laughs> <laughs> one team must be put to the challenge. That's that sounds that sounds incredible. That's that is good. exactly what I'm going to watch when when we're done recording here, and so. And, you know, in a way, it was like my first professional success in that I had wrote the script and then I edited the, 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 the piece myself on my laptop, which at the time was right at this transition point as the industry was starting to transition from these big, extensive, expensive edit rooms running on the Avid system to off the shelf Max running Final Cut Pro. And so that combination of being a creative but also being a tech geek was something that was a big part of my career progress, like you could say. Um, and to cap the story off, I guess, is that I remember talking to my mother, who was down at the Jersey Shore at the time, and she said, you know, I went over Aunt Rita's house, and there was a sticky note on her television to watch the Rocket Power movie on February 14th. <laughs> So that trailer, and, and at the time, that really fairly poor TV movie, I think, got some of the highest like one-time ratings Nickelodeon achieved. <laughs> and it was it was there wasn't a lot of, and, and I think in a way, like that is that approach of taking a kind of genre style and applying it in a new domain is something that's come to dominate a lot of what. We've done an emergent order, including freedom on trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you see the sort of echo of, hey, here's this fun topic. How can we take like a big entertainment convention and overlay it in a surprising way? And I, it's been it's, it's something that just, you know, the Kane's Hayek rap videos do that. The cronies did it. And I think freedom on trial is a, like the latest incarnation of this effort to sort of blend unlikely um, ideas with with style forms. So if that's how you got into filmmaking, how did you get into libertarian filmmaking? <laughs> the, uh, the, um, the vast – it's the, the vast market pace, place of libertarian filmmakers, yes. of course. How could you avoid – how could you not bump into it along the way? Um, so I um, – I've told this story a couple times that when the when the uh, uh, Hayek versus Keynes rap videos that I created with Russ Roberts came out. But the short version is it was this intersection of the rise of social media causing political debates, especially in the run up to the 2008 election, to become way more heated and way more present, even in a workplace that has nothing to do with politics. So the 2008 election, you know, Facebook starts to escape from just being something college kids use in 2006. And by 2007, you know, everyone in your office is suddenly on Facebook and starting to share their thoughts about the election without there, without any sort of social norms sort of established. Not that not that many have been established since <laughs> as I think about it, but um, but just sort of unfiltered. And so that so pol- the political sort of dialogue was accelerating and being very p- pulled to the foreground at the same time that I was now older, married, had a mortgage, was concerned about interest rates and the financial crisis um, and the sort of breakdown of the of the mortgage market and everything was something that up until that point in my life, I probably just I don't think I had the the skin in the game to care about. 
And so that was sort of the, a broader context. And then in particular, Ron Paul's sort of singular voice pointing to what seemed like the only rational, plausible take on what was going on really was the invitation for me to take a look. I'd always sort of seen myself as a a conservative Republican, essentially inherited from my family, as, as a lot of people's politics are. And it was really through Ron Paul, as well as essentially being, um, you know, spending over a decade working in the diversity of views of New York City that, in a sense, moved me to the left into libertarianism, <laughs> <laughs> to the point where I very much, I very much feel more like a, a left libertarian in a lot of respects. Uh, you know, my concerns that what animates my interest in libertarianism is a very humanistic belief in the, in freedom as an empowering force for good, as opposed to um, a kind of religious adherence to the Constitution or. Um, uh, a kind of traditionalist, well, this is the American way. Like, I really believe that freedom and the co- sort of classical liberal conception of it is is the true path to, like, human betterment. And, um, and, and so, for me, that's what all gelled as I think I got more mature <laughs> and, and, and circumstances, you know, raised awareness about well, what's happening in the world of politics and economics. Talk a little bit about the the Hayek Keynes rap battle videos. What, what was the the genesis of that? Did, was that your idea originally, and you contacted Russ, or did you come up with it together? How did that end it's up a happening? Very odd idea. <laughs> yeah, if, I, if I just pitched it to someone immediately, especially at the time, because rap battles are are more common. I guess we have the the epic rap battles of history, and and of course Keynes Hayek. Uh, and so I feel like at the time, which what year did the first one come come out? It, uh, we released the first one, Fear the Boom and Bust, in January of 2010. Right. At, I, at I remember that time, hearing. Yeah. So that was I had been at Cato for six months or something. I think then, and I remember hearing there's this Hayek Keynes rap battle video, and you got to watch it and. Preparing for it to be really bad because it sounds like the kind of thing that would be really bad, and then it totally wasn't. So, Econ Talk. So, as I said before we started, uh, this podcast has actually uh, entered the top of my list alongside of Econ Talk. But my first love will always be Econ Talk. That's okay. It's ours too, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I that beca- I had this long bus commute, which was a big, which was essentially my schooling because I didn't take any formal economics as an. Uh, in my education. And so I was listening to Econ Talk as well as like Planet Money from NPR, which, which was always exceptional and, and very classical liberal, really, when you, when you listen to it, um, you know, because they are interested in actual facts. After the election and with the bailouts and this massive stimulus program, I was really animated into a kind of activism. I wanted to try to get the message out that we're doing all the wrong things, that we're like repeating the same mistakes that got us into the mess, in my view, from reading about Hayek and listening to Ron Paul and reading Monetary Mischief from Milton Friedman and listening to Econ Talk. And so I, I, I decided, actually with a lot of instigation from my wife, Lisa, who, who really said, you got to do something interesting with this interest because, man, this economics that you're so excited about is the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> um, and she's always in, she's always pushed uh, uh, me to try to think in a mainstream way because I can be as about as hardcore a libertarian geek as, as one can find. Um, and if you don't believe me, pick up the laissez-faire books edition of, you know, A Tiger by the Tail – because I wrote a foreword for it, which, which, which is like my faux attempt at being an, an intellectual. <laughs> um, but but uh, I reached out. I cold called Russ Roberts because I thought, well, hey, if, there's, I, if, if I just try to do something about the boom and bust on my own, who the hell is going to pay attention to me? I'm not an economist. I don't have any credibility in that domain. And, and I also want to check to make sure I'm even like getting some of this stuff right. And so I cold called Russ, left this like winding message about how I was a creative director at Spike and got interested in monetary policy and wanted to make a video with him. And I was really excited about Hayek. And when Russ called me back, I swear this was more exciting than like than any celebrity shoot I'd ever been on or directed. And 
I, and I even got to shoot a, um, a shot for shot recreation of the original back to the future movie trailer with Michael J. Fox. And yet even including that, I think I was more excited to get a call back from Russ Roberts. We were pretty excited when he came on on Free Thoughts too, so we understand. It's he's, weird how he's, hearing the voice come out of someone. I know. <laughs> he's he's just I really believe he is the best living economist today. And I say that because I think he has um he embodies that classical liberal political economy that's richer than um, most economists who've come up through this um, much more mathematically oriented, much more equilibrium minded school. I mean, he's just a he's a he's a true economist. Um, so uh, so we started to have a dialogue and Russ is a very small C conservative person when it comes to taking on projects. He's always very busy. A lot of people I, I, I realize I learned to approach him about things. And so it took about it took about nine months from the first phone call to the finite completion of Free of the Boom and Bust. And we took many zigs and zags along the way. It didn't start off as a rap battle. We originally thought, well, maybe we'll do like a faux um, sitcom with K- Keynes and Hayek as a, like the odd couple. And then we thought, well, that's going to be really hard to pull off and it might not be very good. So why don't we do the uh, – the, um, like just the show open and make like a funny spoofy show open to that show and that will be the video. And then – and then Russ made an offhanded joke about doing a rap battle, and I immediately glommed onto it and thought, you know what, that's actually a great format for a back and forth and the cadence of rap. And I'm, I wasn't I wasn't much of a rap fan, which is the other ironic thing. So I had to basically – have either of you seen the movie um, Hustle and Flow? Uh, no. I, have you seen that movie? No. So uh, in, this, in, in Hustle and Flow, there, it, you, basically the, the, it's the story of a, of a pimp – who has rap talent and becomes like a, a an up and coming rapper, and, but you watch it very tangibly happen. Like he just lays down these rhymes, and he's got a buddy that's a music teacher, and he takes the he takes his rhymes to his buddy, and he's like, "Well, you don't have a hook." He's like, "Well, what's a hook?" It's like it's the refrain. It's it's what repeats and sort of pulls you in. And I literally had that exact same experience. I did a one crazy overnight pass on the on the first lyrics of Fear the Boom and Bust that probably got them about 75% to 80% there and brought and actually did a recording of it. I brought it into some to, to Spike and I used the instrumental version of this song Remember the Name which had this simple strings kind of classical rhythm as a bass and played it for a, a buddy of mine that was also a, a musician and he listened to it. He's like, that's actually pretty – that's not bad. But there's no hook. There's no refrain. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right, the refrain. Well, how many of those do you need? He's like, oh, like about every 12 to 16 bars. I was like, oh, well, what's a bar? It's like, oh, <laughs> each – yeah, I, I mean I was really like – it was like a child recreating something that's been well understood for, for centuries. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, like every line is like a bar. And so like four bars is a measure. And, and so, okay – so then I went back to the script and said, well, the, actually, the first four lines are a pretty good refrain. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Blame low interest rates. No, it's the animal spirits. And so I took that, copied it basically every four to six uh, measures of lyric and then worked with it with Russ for like three, four months. And then we and, – and Lisa found the actors that play Bill, that Billy and Adam who play Keynes and Hayek. And because Russ is such a great public intellectual and, and, and such a welcoming personality, he had great relationships with PBS and NPR. And so that gave us some initial coverage to help us launch the project. So we actually had the folks at PBS NewsHour film at um, one of our recording sessions. And there, there was a – before the release of the video, there was actually a story on NPR about the rise of Keynes. And I, I have to say, like, it was pretty neat because that story became not just the rise of Keynes, but the debate about Keynes versus Hayek, which it wouldn't have been had it not – had they not engaged Russ and I about this project. So, so like, in a way, we had already started to make an impact on getting Hayek's ideas out to more people even before the video was released. And that taught me a lot about the way you can kind of work with media, you know, friends in the media to kind of help 
you know, make an impact and, and, and balance out the, the story that's out there. No. And so, it, you know, it was released on like Jan the end of January in 2010. And it was just so salient because, you know, we were right in the thick of this debate about stimulus and what grows the economy and, and, um, and how do you get out of what caused the great recession and, you know, the, what's, why is the unemployment still, you know, so high and all of that stuff. So it really, it was a very fertile time to, to sort of bring this kind of approach to the table. And it got him, and we didn't have any media dollars behind it. Frankly, I don't think you could reproduce. It'd be very hard to, if we were, if we launched the same video today, I don't think it would have gotten the, the kind of traction without a lot, without a different amount of like support than what happened back in 2010. And then we had the, and then we did a sequel in 2011, fight of the century. So the sequel was, was just sort of by popular demand or, I mean, I know there was a lot more attention of course paid after the first one. And then people just sort of wanted more. It seemed like I did. I know I did. So, so after the first one, I started to, it was really when I first started to genuinely become aware of the broader movement outside of frankly, the Cato Institute and econ talk. Because I was listening, you know, Cato has always been a go-to for me as far as finding, um, finding, I, I, you know, great a great source of ideas and and just raw material to try to understand what it means to be a classical liberal and what it means to, uh, you know, have a free market operate and, and solve problems in a free market society. So. Uh, I started to get approached by folks in the movement that were interested in doing trying to do more things like this. And it seemed like not people had, like you guys said, like people weren't expecting it. I don't think people thought it was possible to do something like that. So we, Russ and I were invited by the economist magazine to their annual buttonwood gathering, which is this kind of, um, highfalutin conference with like heads of state and central bankers and all kinds of crazy people. And, so we wrote, and this was about, this was in the fall of 2010. And so at that point, the, the video had gotten over a million views all, or, all like organically and been covered all over the rest of the media. And we decided, since that was such a big opportunity, we wrote lyrics as a kind of sequel follow-on and had Billy and Adam perform these lyrics. And they were an early version of Fight of the Century. And... Um, and after, and the, and that that video is actually on the Econ Stories YouTube channel. This uh, the, the Buttonwood Gathering event, and so coming out of that, and it was very. I mean, it was like you know, central bank, the head of the central bank of England at the time was there, and all kinds of crazy people. So we um, we then had this raw material, and and, and Brian Hooks and the folks at the Mercatus Center had uh, helped raise money to make another bigger, better version on the basis of that script. And so I wanted to just take everything to the next level. So we, we brought in a, a, this awesome vocalist, Charlie Murphy, who happens to be like Eddie Murphy's brother, but he's got this great voice and presence. And we made them the song more of a, more of an exchange. So instead of in the first one, it's just Kane says his thing. And then Hayek says his, and the second one, it's much more of a battle where they're like, you know, parrying and, and sparring back and forth lyrically and we took the production value way up and used had a much bigger crew with tons of extras and this period set and this boxing ring and the and um and it it was uh you know and then it really kind of matched the trajectory as far as the media interest cuz you know the, i mean tragically one year later the debate about the boom and bust was just as present in people's concerns as it was you know a year prior because of the depth of the great recession and that, and it's just a sort of button on that, that project, Fight of the Century, was the, the sort of maiden voyage for me as an entrepreneur. We, Josh and I left Spike, and the three of us with him and Lisa started Emergent Order, and that was our first production as an independent company. So let's turn to Freedom on Trial, uh, which came out. We are recording this on Wednesday, and it came out on Monday of this week. Um, and so we approached you, we being libertarianism.org, approached you guys to do a cool video stuff for us because uh, <laughs> we were terribly jealous of the other people who got to do cool video stuff with you. Well, first, I tell us, tell our 
listeners, if they haven't watched already, would shame on them, um, but we'll put links in the show notes, um, what Freedom on Trial is and then how this idea came about. So when you guys approached us, we were very excited because obviously Cato really is the, you know, the premier uh, libertarian think tank and sort of institution. And so it was a really exciting opportunity for, for our team and for me personally. And, um, you know, and, and also what was just so great is that you libertarianism dot org, you know, is is very much an, a, a like a safe space to engage ideas without have, without necessarily being tethered directly to the more tangible mechanics of particular public policy. So it's a chance to engage the audience with the fundamental ethical and economic and moral frameworks of classical liberalism in a free society, both historically and today. And, and so that was a gr- that was like our, it's our it's like it, you know, we don't always get to be doing projects that are so fundamentally educational and idea driven. But that's what we exist to do. That's why I started this company with my with my friends and family. And so. Um, freedom on trial is very much in keeping with that tradition of of, um, of the Keynes Hayek rap videos and of the cronies, which was another project that we had done several years back, um, of tr- of taking a popular media form in this case a kind of serial courtroom like a procedural courtroom drama a, a la you know Law and Order, and using that as a device dramatically to engage. Uh, freedom related t- subjects. So in this case, you know, the, the setup of the story is that we have lawyers for liberty, an underdog law law partnership uh, of William and Holly, who try to take on underdog cases of people whose uh, rights and freedoms have been, you know, constrained or trampled or under threat, and and defend them in the, in the court of law and the court of public opinion. Sounds sounds like the Institute for Justice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the it's the dramatic telling of the Institute for Justice or or the Pacific Legal Foundation, and um, and so uh, in in this what we what we really saw again like um, aspirationally as a pilot was to take to, that they would take on this case of Philip Carvel, a small hardware store owner who um, has a young employee that he's paying below the minimum wage and is prosecuted for doing so and who's and 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 the case takes a dramatic turn when it when its fr- its frame and its scope is broadened by the prosecution to really be a discussion of inequality in the country as a whole and so obviously that's a very salient topic right now but it's, it's also very evergreen and um you know, it's also very, it's always convenient how um, they never want to index the minimum wage to inflation because that would prevent politicians from getting to reignite it as a new issue every several years. Mm-hmm. So that's obvious. But um, but so that's that's the basic story. Is that it's a legal drama, uh, w- you know, with a, with high personal stakes for the characters, and along the way we get to hear the flavor of the arguments. That on both sides, and again, in keeping with I think the ethics of you guys and your organization and of libertarianism dot org, um, and it was such a great collaboration because you really encouraged us to be um, to to give both sides strong arguments and to let the let the, um, the 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 debate that takes place be a full and balanced and robust debate. So even though our sort of heroes, if you will, are the classical liberal lawyers, we didn't. Um, hobble the arguments of the prosecution or the other side in any way. And that's that was something that was a kind of ethos that began with the Keynes Hayek rap videos for me personally. And I just think it's a great way to engage dialogue. How does that then impact what you're hoping viewers of Freedom on Trial will get out of it? Because if it had been – so the one way to present it, which is how we opted not to, which would be would be to have the libertarian side win – you know, we we say here's here's a ba- set of bad arguments, and we're going to knock them down, and therefore liberty, uh, and that would be a clear goal. Our goal would be to show the audience that the arguments in favor of the minimum wage don't work. Um, and well, I think we did a bit of that. This, like you said, trying to give every side a a chance to express their view as strongly as possible and take them seriously. 
it ends up leaving things. I mean, we won't we won't give away the ending, um, but it ends up leaving things a bit more ambiguous. And so, what were you hoping that an audience, someone who watches that, who's not already say a committed libertarian, gets out of it? If it's not that libertarianism trounces statism, I think that one of the things I learned about politics broadly defined, political economy, debates over big ideas, from being at in Viacom and being someone who was um, politically not sort of in the mainstay of my peers on a lot of issues, was that you get more bees with honey and you engage a much more rich dialogue with people when you don't immediately push their buttons and and trigger their tribal impulses. Nobody wants to listen to you if they just think you're a jerk or if you're being uh, too strident in your in your position and don't seem to even know or care about their concerns. And so, you know, I, I think with all of our projects, we try to do this. We try to – and it's not just a matter of like sort of strategic positioning, although I think it does that too. Um, but to, to, to disarm people of their prejudices in the body of the of the project, to have the I think like you know for us like having it be very highly produced is part of that signaling of making something inviting to watch. But then I think having um, a, and a, a, you can't avoid the fact that these are deeply contentious subjects, and that there are well intentioned people on both sides. And I think if you if you just set up the opposition, in this case, people who believe that government not only should have the right to interfere with the um, agreements of two consenting adult parties, but that it will make them better off or it will make society as a whole better off, you know, I, nobody's nobody's twirling their mustache as a villain thinking that for the most part. I mean, maybe – a, you know, a handful of narrow interests are doing so, the sort of like bat, the, the, the bootleggers of the crowd. But most people want to make the world a better place. And so I think you have to I – th I think it's important to embed that understanding in, the, in your storytelling. And I think as a filmmaker and, and as, a, 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 as a storyteller, um, you have richer, more dramatic characters when they're not just white hats and black hats. I think white hats and black hats is boring. I think com the character complexity is a huge part of what makes a dramatic story be dramatic and be surprising. And you, you know, you don't want you know if you, if you know what the ending is going to be right before you start, are you even going to watch to the end? Like that's that's it's just it's so I think it's both philosophically and morally a good way to go, and I think it's dramatically a good way to go. Was this a a different kind of project than Emergent Order had done in the past? Did you was this? something new to you guys and and how you had to go about doing it? Well, um we had done one uh scripted dramatic web series prior to this that I think was sort of a good prototype in a way which was um the Love Gov series that we that we produced that we created for the Independent Institute. And so we had already managed I think to successfully tell a character driven story that had a didactic framework to it without it being, you know, uh, you know, one, one commenter said, this is not cringeworthy, which, <laughs> which, which in one hand feels like faint praise. But I think, but when you're trying to actually like unpack these kind of ideas, that's actually great praise from, from my perspective. <laughs> Cause it's like you said, you, you know, the pitch of these things, uh, your first impulse is, oh, that's not going to be very good. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. That's like that's the the real fascinating, I guess, uh, challenge that you're engaged with, and, and it's what we thought about when we were discussing the different concepts for for the movies was was what would not be cringeworthy, and it, it's kind of <laughs> odd because you, there's a lot of tropes out there, um, like Captain Planet. Yeah. Which is being turned into a live action movie. Well, now. well I think Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> wants to turn it into a live action oh, movie. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, no. yeah, yeah. But Cap I mean, <laughs> Captain amazing. Planet is is, I mean, absolutely unbelievably ridiculous. Uh, but people don't really perceive it as 
I mean, I think people perceive it as ridiculous because it's a 90s cartoon and it's a little bit pompous, but not because the evil corporations are trying to kill the environment and there's a superhero saving it. Uh, and if we tried to make a, I don't know, Captain Capitalism or Captain Free Markets or something like that, um, I mean, I guess we could do it if we parodied Captain Planet. You should put that one in your in your idea bank of Captain Free Markets that parodies Captain Planet. But it would be very cringer. Or if we tried to make a a movie where the government, because businessmen are often the the real big snidely whiplashes who are always twirling their mustaches, and that doesn't make people cringe. But we, it seems that we have a cringe deficit in terms of trying to convey libertarian ideas without sounding too preachy and not having people just cringe at what we're saying. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, I mean you notice this in – not just in the more didactic filmmaking that you know we're engaged in as the Cato Institute and libertarianism.org who have a mes message we want to promote but also in just general say Hollywood filmmaking. It always – it seems like the left is able to get away with producing – more ideological stuff than libertarians or conservatives are that when you know you can watch you can watch a hollywood movie that has an extremely leftist message and simply enjoy it as a movie but when it's a libertarian or conservative message that cringeworthiness often comes out and is often you know it's it's a justified response on your part like the, the <laughs> film simply is more cringeworthy and so why is that? Why why does the left seem better at making non cringe words the political stuff than we are? It's a great question. It's something I've thought about a lot. Um, I think that well, first, and I you know be, in, be, just before things get a get away, if we don't come back to it, you know we you know our team had put together as you know like five or six different unique ideas that were all intended to be something that you could repeat to tackle many different subjects from a classical liberal point of view. And it was actually Max Borders, who's one of uh, the mem you know, members of my team and, um, and you know, really like a, and a great you know, philosopher and thinker in his own right that came up with the idea for uh, the freedom on trial. And then we discussed, well, should it be freedom on trial or should it be government on trial? So there's a lot of the, the process of just arriving at the idea you know, as you got to experience with us is, is this big, broad exploration. And then the second half, which is really like the 98% that matters in another, in another sense is that, well, okay, we've got the 2% inspiration. How does the, how does the perspiration, how does the execution play out? Which is, I think something that we've always tried our best as a company to do. And I think that's, that's the first part is I think that a lot of, I think that there's a craftsmanship deficit creatively on the um, – God, I hate to say on the right, but I guess I'll just say it, like on the right. I, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's like like genetic that there tends to – you know, if you tend to be more creative and aesthetic that your your brain tends to be wired to be a little more collectivist. I, I, there's something there. There's a – like there's like a clear ideological delineation between creative fields versus more um, – systematic fields like engineering and construction and, 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 other, and other disciplines in, as far as the way people's politics break down. But I think um, one other like big picture is I think people in the political circles, especially that, you know, on the sort of free market or right of center, so to speak, have this notion that Hollywood is sort of driven by ideology. And I actually think, don't think that's correct. I think there's an ideological bias that's like, uh, like endogenous, like I was just saying. But Hollywood just wants to make money. Hollywood's like R Randian capitalism on steroids. It's it's very transactional. If if if, uh, I mean, you, you don't have to look any further than the post Passion of the Christ bout of of Christian TV shows and movies that were suddenly all the rage. It's you know. Uh, if it can find an audience, um, the business folks in, in, in Hollywood are going to make it. And so that leaves us with this question of if it's not sort of a systematic bias at the business level, it's an aesthetic bias. And I actually think we have a real challenge on our hands because what is our story? Our story is the invisible hand. 
our story is trying to show the unseen. <laughs> These are not easy things to point a camera at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, a very. I mean, one of the things about there's a great there's a sort of um, if if Mises's human action is like a is like a is a can, canonical tome of classical liberalism, it has a corollary in the in the storytelling world, which is Robert McKee's story, and in that book, I mean, it basically is the human action of storytelling. It says. People's character is revealed through action. It's revealed through the choices they make. Not the, not what they say, it's what they do. And the problem we face is that dramatically, a lot of our stories are often not of the, in, the individual motivations and, in, and intentions of a person, but the actual like outcomes of systematic incentives that actually, like as Milton Friedman would say, guide even bad people to do good things. Well, when you're trying to tell a character story, m people's individual motivations matter. Like you judge the character. The goal is to have their personal character revealed. Like it's, it's like why the word character both means a person, but also their nature, their moral frame, like their moral nature. And I think that's really hard when you're trying to when you're trying to say, look, yes, this statement that we want to help poor people that are working live better. Well, I can do that by passing this law that tells these greedy rich people to raise, to pay them more. That is that the intentions are there. And so you can tell that story that Mr. Smith goes to Washington story of the reformer that takes on Capitol Hill to, you know, the classic, like probably the best example would be the movie Dave, where you've got I was this, just like, going to say Dave. Yes. this is, yeah. I love that movie, but it is also just absolutely aggravating. But yeah, you wonder how you could tell that if, if it was a libertarian story. Well, I made, I made the crack, I think Trevor a while back that the reason I adore the, the West Wing TV show, um, which is not a popular opinion, I think among my colleagues. I but, do too. But I had remarked to Trevor that a libertarian West Wing wouldn't work dramatically. It would be boring as hell because it would just be a president sitting in the Oval Office saying, well, I ain't going to do anything about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's nothing – that's beyond the scope of what I am capable of doing. I don't have the knowledge or incentives to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, OK. It would not make for an exciting 45 minutes of television. Yeah. And in Dave, he, 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 the big thing is what he proposes employing, having the government give everyone a job and, and it's just – Absolutely infuriating, but then you're like, hey, it's kind of you know endearing in its own way. Yeah, and 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 I think that's it's it's baked into character driven storytelling that we care about the character's motivation, we care about a real live person and what they do, and so we have to somehow find a way to tell freedom stories that are about individual people's character. I mean, that was what we tried to accomplish with Freedom on Trial by, you know, presenting the impact of these two people and framing it around that. And and, um, and it's still very – it's very, very difficult. I think there are, there are some great movies that point towards um, ways of doing this. I think one of the best is, is – um, uh, Dallas Buyers Club. Agreed. That, that, that was my next question, actually, which is, what is your favorite libertarian movie? But oh, my favorite libertarian movie is real easy. It's Ghostbusters by a million <laughs> miles. It is the most libertarian movie ever made. I don't know if it's just that like markets were the when the air in the eighties. I mean, I'm actually looking across my office right now at a framed LP of Ghostbusters and the complete. Like five hundred dollars worth of Legos set of the firehouse and the Ecto One. <laughs> wow, he's, he's he's really not kidding. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed you're willing to admit that on the air. No, that's I mean that is that is interesting. They, they have, I've heard the Ghostbusters thing a lot, and I agree with you. Um, and it's interesting because I often say Doctor Strangelove is one of the great libertarian movies, but the the both of those movies are incidentally about 
freedom and markets and entrepreneurship or in the case of Dr. Strangelove, the complete and utter idiocy of people in the government, which I, which, which I think is important. It, it, it can be difficult to, to go out and intentionally try to make an ideologically charged movie. But if you incidentally tell a story of freedom, then it, it might be a little bit more resonant. And that's also true of Dallas Buyers Club. I think it's this, um, you know, there's these sort of dramatic structures of, uh, of, of man versus man, man versus the, the nature, man versus the system. And I think that um, there's a lot of great freedom storytelling to be told in the framework of man versus the system, which is what Dallas Buyers Club is. Um, and to some extent, it's what Ghostbusters is. It's, it, you know, the, the bad guys – are, are, it's like it's hard to tell who's the bigger bad guy, the EPA regulator or the or the actual ghosts trying to destroy, destroy New York City. You know, and he's like the classic Adam Smith man of system, you know, Walter Peck. Yes, yeah, it is true. He, he, the, that man has no dick. Isn't that the, isn't that the question? In, 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 <laughs> the, the famous line in the movie. You know, it, it, it is a, it is a great libertarian classic. But again, that, that's the interesting thing about the challenge of freedom on trial is it's obviously explicitly ideological to some degree, uh, but you also have to tell a story that's worth watching. With compelling characters. Yeah, and I think so. I think it's like you have to find ways of grounding. Um, of staying at the ground level, at the level of, of human action, of people doing things. And um, and you have to let, I think, good storytelling – and look, 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 as a firm and as a storyteller, we don't always get this right. I mean, you know, but, but we try to actually put story first on the basis that if you don't have a good story, nobody's going to walk through the door. So no matter how nicely you've set up the room, if they don't walk through the door, it doesn't matter. So the story has – and I think that's – you know. so I think there's this class of didactic movies that are garbage and they, they do span the spectrum. There's probably – because of the sheer volume differences, there's probably as many horrible left-wing ideological screed movies as there are free market or right-wing – ones the the free market ones stand out to the extent they're free market in fact at all because of the success to failure ratio on the right is way different <laughs> but but i mean you like take a movie like elysium and you could argue about whether that whether it's really an an, an analogy about immigration versus an analogy about eco economics and capitalism but i mean that movie is horrible and it's it wears its ideology on its sleeve in a way that the prior film by that director, District Nine, didn't do. So where do we take Freedom on Trial from here? Do you have ideas for things you'd like to explore in future episodes? Well, I think um, if the world of support for the project, you know, comes to the table and is interested in in there being more stories like this. I think what we tried to do with the, with the series and, and thinking of it as a pilot is set up a structure that's repeatable in that they can take on so many different kinds of stories. I mean, like you, you guys mentioned, um, you know, the, the legal advocacy groups like like uh, IJ or PLF and um, and uh, almost any story out of their docket is is something that I think could could make for a compelling case. I think it's it'd be interesting to take on the victims of the drug war and to really take on things that are, are less obviously on the political right, like, uh, you know, things that surround criminal justice or immigration, for that matter. I mean, to take on this uh, this some of the more populist issues that are um, soul crushing as a libertarian <laughs> in 2016. Um, but but I think there's a, there's a kind of endless supply of human stories where uh, the, the lawyers for liberty could make the case for more individual freedom and autonomy. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.